accountant or a lawyer and starting to think about exiting your business in the next two or three years? In this episode, I'm talking to James Gosling, who works in this area and buying and selling accounting industries in particular, and he's sharing his insights in what's happening in this world, what's happening with roll-ups, what are the PEs doing, how they're valuing accounting practices, and what you can do to make your business more attractive and more valuable to be acquired in the short term. And he even gives us a little insight on timing in the market, which you don't normally get. It's a really insightful episode, especially if you're an accountant, you want to listen to this one. Welcome to the podcast that's dedicated to helping business owners to prepare for exit so you can maximize value and then exit on your terms. This is the Exit Insights podcast presented by Succession Plus. I'm Daryl Bates Brownsword, and today I'm joined by James Gosling. Welcome, James. Thanks for joining me today. No, thank you for having me, Daryl. Hope you're well. Yeah. Hey, now you've got a background in M and A specifically for the accounting and legal sectors. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, we've been yeah. Uh, concentrating on that for the last yeah good few years now. Yeah, and we're we're going to explore why I asked you to come on the show and join me. Is that I thought it was about time that we we got some specific uh, a lot of business owners out there who are starting to think about exiting their business. A lot of them are accountants and lawyers as well, and. They're, they've got a lot of information around what's happening in their industry and their, their sector trends. But I thought it'd be really useful for those who haven't quite kept their finger on the pulse and just want to know what's possible and where valuations start and what they look like for, for you know, their sector. So let's dig in, shall we? Absolutely. Absolutely. Why? Look, I don't know if this is a fair question or not, but uh, I'm not always known for being totally fair. But can you start by giving us, I guess, a bit of an overview of what's been happening in the in the sector the last the last couple of years, <clears throat> where, where are we at? Well, yeah, I mean the, the accountancy the sector is going through a wholesale change at the moment, um, probably sparked by by COVID initially, uh, but also with various investment houses, private equity coming into the market as well, um, and obviously the huge evolution of the use of uh, technology, software, and, and AI um, has been driving all the changes that we see at the moment. So over the last few years, uh, the accounting practice industry has seen, as I mentioned, some more and more private equity come into the market, which has meant there's been some more platforms that have been set up, each with their own nuances and what they're looking to offer and the way they, they go about acquiring and growing, but offering you know different um, different service lines, different models uh, for those that are looking to be part of the firm. So that's been quite interesting to see that growth. But likewise, you've seen the much smaller firms that may be struggling for recruitment, struggling for succession and struggling to keep up with the, the pace of change uh, in terms of software and then also you know compliance and the old red tape is getting harder and tougher uh, to keep up with and keep up to the paperwork so all of all of those pressures and different factors are now seeing a, 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 you know probably the largest amount of activity we've seen in the accountancy practice uh, industry for, for for some 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 time so you mentioned there a number of roll-ups and we've we've seen uh, specifically accounting sector roll-ups, you know, well, for as long as I've been around. So that's that's been doing this for 20 years. We've seen people acquiring businesses and, you know, and then ended up uh, com, com, you know, acquiring a whole lot of practices, putting them together under one brand and then often listing them and then to see it disappear after a few years. Well, are there any changes to the, you know, because if it hasn't worked to date, um, you know, yeah. on, on paper, it looks like a, a, a brilliant concept and a great idea, but we haven't been able to make it work yet. Are, are, are the PE houses doing anything different this time around? This yeah, latest they're, they're, so, yeah, absolutely. I think that I think the the approach is a lot different. Where, you know, previously those roll ups, it was a case of acquiring everything and anything they could. Completely different cultures, completely different service lines, completely different yeah. clients, different <laughs> geographical locations, and then trying to force them under one roof. And as we know, in any M&A transaction, cultural alignment and integration is absolutely key. Um, so I think that was the previous approach. And now what we're seeing with the new platforms and private equity coming to the market is they're, they're trying to work as a, a growth partner and I guess not have that private equity um, stigma attached to it where it's, you know, come in, look at the bottom line, we're going to take away all the costs. Because it's a people-based business, the accountancy practice space. So you need to make sure that you've got the accountants still at the forefront of what they're doing. They understand the market more than anyone. So what the private equity are doing is sitting in the background saying, okay, well, you know your market best, but what we can do is enhance and add value to what you're doing. That's both with 
you know, help around M&A. We are the ones that understand M&A and can help you on that journey. We can help you with integration. We can help you invest in technology and advance the technological journey that you're on as well, as well as you know, adding funding um, and other, other routes to exit. So I think it's more of a, a growth partner approach rather than a private equity takeover as such. Okay, so it's, that makes sense. So it looks like the you know, and what I heard at the beginning of that that answer as well is is historically it was kind of just a pure spreadsheet exercise, um, and now they're going well. Hang on, different companies are different. They've all got different cultures. For this to work, we need to line them up and, and get the right similar types of businesses to, to yeah. You know, if we're going to have any chance of success for them to to fit and work and be similar. Yeah. In terms of what is it that makes one practice a, a, attractive uh, to you know for an acquirer who's doing a bit of a roll up? Do, do they need a certain size? Do they need expertise. Do they need to be doing advisory. What, what are they looking for? It depends on the model and it depends on the platform. But in general terms, you know, usually any of these these types of conversations is going to be where there's, there is a retire retirement or retirements coming up, um, yep. but they're also going to have to have good senior leadership underneath those success team coming through. Those that are going to be able to run that office or at least go on a journey with the private equity house or the platform for some time. And then from there, it comes down to, yeah, what service lines are you offering, your pricing, how good are you um, at keeping uh, data, uh, good quality data. So again, that's where the software piece comes in, what, what you're using for your practice management. Have you, have you got good profitability? Are you codifying all your processes? I mean, all of these things, as well as making yourself quite attractive, will make the, the actual transaction process a lot easier. Um, as well from a DD point of view. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of the thing that you should be looking at to make yourself as attractive as possible. Okay, so the reassuring thing is, for, from my perspective, everything you just described applies to every industry. You know, mm -hmm. What's our client retention look like? Is our, is our revenue predictable? Is it consistent? What, what, what staff are in the business? You know, what's the culture like in the business? Are the staff loyal and, and you know, we've got low churn? Uh, then you start talking about what are we selling the clients, you know, yep. what, what blender services. And then you talk about codifying. Have we got systems and structures in the business? You didn't specifically mention marketing, but that's you know, hit and miss with account the, the industry. Um, but then we talked about our positioning and what, you, what makes one practice. What are they known for? So all the same things, which is reassuring. You know, hey, presto, an accounting business is just like any other business when, when we're looking for valuation. So what about size, James? So, you know, because we, you know, every now and then I, I, I hear stories and I meet people who are looking to acquire accounting practices and, and they might have a business that's you know, doing half a mil. Is, is that yeah. attractive? Because it's effectively one partner with a really good team around them, really productive, half a dozen helpers or so, you know, a business of that sort of size. And, but you take the key person out, which is, yeah, is is that attractive for these acquirers because they can just plug it into a bigger model? Absolutely, absolutely. And this is one of the conversations I have with a, a lot of practitioners at that, that you know half a million, maybe even sub half a million revenue. Okay. They, just, they just don't think their business has got value, or they don't understand that it's going to be attractive. Unfortunately, a lot of them just start speaking to other local, local accountants and letting their, their their clients fade away, and then their staff have to find another <laughs> job. When actually, guys, you know, sell your businesses or value, you can retire with a nice handsome sun in your back pocket so you can enjoy yourself in retirement. Um, so size-wise, yes, absolutely. You know, a lot of these larger model firms, uh, platform firms, were looking for hubs in certain geographical locations. So you need to be of a certain size for it to be practical in a new geographical location. That tends to be around about the 2 million mark uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a baseline. But then once you've got that hub set up, then by all means, you know, the, the add-ons or the bolt-ons these other these other businesses uh, for sure would be of interest, you know, sub one million and beyond. Okay, and, and what about especially if there's a niche, right? And, and what about in terms of valuation, James? Because we hear all sorts of stories, and I'd love to get your perspective on what, how businesses are valued now, if that's changed over time, and you know, does the valuation formula change with size of business, for example? Um, and if so, yep. what 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 point does it change? Yeah, so traditionally, uh, accountancy practices were always valued upon their, their GRF or their revenue. And that, that still very much is the same today in the sub 1 million category. And so if, you, if your firm's sub 1 million, you're probably looking to get anywhere between 1 and 1.2 times your revenue. Yeah. Um, if you've got a real niche, I have seen 1.25, three times 
uh, 1.3 times, sorry, as the absolute maximum and, and seal in there. And there are more inquiries now starting to adopt an EBITDA model, even at that sub 1 million mark. Um, sub so, 1 million? Yeah, they're looking at wow. the EBITDA um, on some occasions, and that kind of ranges from three to five times, generally, generally speaking. Above the 1 million mark, certainly in EBITDA multiple that you'll be looking at, um, and most of the time, again, that's three to five times um, at this point in time. And that's obviously adjusted for salaries, et cetera, from the directors and partners uh, that are staying on. And then really it starts to get slightly higher um, if your revenue is getting towards the five million mark and above, um, then the EBITDA multiples. We have even seen a slight increase recently, but that's more so a simple supply and demand dynamics in the market at the moment at that level, where you're probably looking at six, possibly seven times. And then when you get towards the 10 million mark of revenue, um, you know, seven, eight times we're seeing. And then beyond that, it really depends. The highest I've known of uh, was a 10 times multiple um, uh, a few weeks ago. And so let's, you know, because we're all curious and everyone wants to think that their business is in the in the bracket where they're going to get 10 times, uh, even and though, and, and what we'll see, we'll go, hey, look, I know of a practice that sold for 10 times. And you know, well, okay, well, it was 10 times, but it was 10 mil plus in, in revenue. And yep. it had all these reasons why it was 10 mil plus. But what the general market tends to hear is just 10 mil plus. So they go, hey, I've got my half million pound or my one million pound practice. <laughs> yep. um, I'm yeehaw, giddy up. I'm going for a 10 times multiple. Are there any things that stand out, James, apart from size and scale of the business that can increase the multiple? And let's just talk about the ones that are already being valued at an EBITDA uh, valuation. Mm-hmm. So they're probably two or three mil plus. I know you said they start at one mil, but let's, you know, a two or three million pound practice. Yep. What can they do to increase their multiple and, you know, to, well, a guarantee a three to five, but maybe even sneak in a cheeky six or seven? Yeah, well, look, I think at that size, um, you would expect the business to at least have the client relationship with other staff members and not the actual principals and owners. But yep. I mean, first and foremost, make sure your business can run without you in it at that level, uh, which you'd hope it would be. Um, you know, making sure your compliance checks, your AD reports are all in line as they are, and, and really make sure that you're as digitized as you can be. The more digital you are in your county practice space, the more attractive you will be um, to to inquirers. Um, and then likewise um, with your uh, with your fee base and fee block. So make sure your charge out rates or your monthly fees are where they should be as as well. Um, and that really makes it a lot more attractive um, and probably will help you get to the higher echelons of, of that. And likewise, if, you're, if you are the principal of the business, then um, make sure that you, you set yourself some time to stay around post-transaction because the, the quicker you leave, the higher the risk, uh, the risk profile goes up to the acquiring party. So, sure. you know, I always say to people, start having these conversations early. If you're two or three years away, have them now and look to make sure because you need to be around for at least two years uh, before you... Um, uh, before you can actually hang up your boots if you want that top multiple. Okay. So, again, good business practices. You've got, um, you know, get get the, the management team buy, you know, into the relationship so that it's not dependent on the, on the principles. Did you mention, what, what about the service provider? I'm assuming that to get the higher multiple, we, we need to be operating at higher or the, you know, the, the benchmark profit levels so that we're, mm-hmm. we're you know, we're not just, yeah, I imagine we've also minimising our write-offs. You know, all, all fees are being paid or everything's being billed and paid. Is I, I'm guessing we're doing some higher value services as well as we're, we're doing the compliance and keeping the clients around long-term, got great client longevity and retention, but I imagine we're upselling them as well and, uh, and, and you know, providing some added value services and, uh, you know, that, that, that makes a difference, I'm guessing. Absolutely, that you know that, that that advisory piece as well. So whether that be you know some corporate finance work, audit work, fractional yep. FD, CFO type work, but then yep. equally because you because you will have those um, higher value clients, you know, larger limited companies, your SME businesses. Then if a, a if a, a platform is coming in to acquire you, they're going to have a greater suite of services. Whether that might be wealth management, for example, uh, or you know something like that. So when you go into when you when the client base goes in. The platform already knowing that we could we could upsell even further from what this business is already doing um, but yeah so the quality of clients is absolutely key okay so what what would you suggest We've, there's an accounting practice out there sort of that that 
that lower, you know, local city size, you know, between half a mil and five mil in revenue. So that that sort of bracket, they're starting to think about, hey, look, I want to get out in two or three years. So they've heard that from you. You've said, give it plenty of time. You really need to be involved in the business. You don't want to be running away for two years. Keep that up your sleeve. But let's say it's two or three years away before they want to do a do a, a deal. What would you be suggesting to them that they do? Like what nitty gritty specific stuff um, should they be working on now to really give themselves the best chance? Preparation is key. It doesn't matter if you're an accountancy practice owner or any business owner, as you all know, Daryl, that, that preparation is absolutely key. So really it's just getting your house absolutely in order, you know, making sure the client relationships were really picked up and moved over to members of staff so that it kind of mitigates the risk factor there. Ensure that all your internal financial reporting is as it should be, uh, which for accountants you'll be surprised to hear is often not the case. So you know, managing accounts up to date, year in accounts filed when they need to be, you know, breakdown of your own practice as well. So that's client client breakdowns into charge out rate types of clients, age profile clients, type of services you're delivering, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So make sure that's all easily attainable. Organisational chart as well. Um, it's kind of the basic documentation that you need to, you know, even codifying your processes, making sure that all your employee or service provider handbooks and, and contracts are all up to date or where they should be. Not signing yourself into any long-term commitments like a long lease, for example, or uh, a long contract with one of the software providers. You need to keep yourself a little bit flexible there because the, any acquirer might already have an office in the in the local area already and not want to be yep. tied into a lease and that's going to make you less attractive as a, as a proposition or bring up its own issues but then also start working to improve your profitability now, as, as we know when, when you're building the business you might and new new clients are coming in you might actually overcompensate in terms of hiring um, and have good capacity within your within your staff and your team you need to get that balance a little bit better as you're heading towards sale because you want to you want to maximise your valuation, um, which means maximising your profitability. So keep keep looking at all of that as well. You might want to cut back on certain costs, not to the detriment of the service level, but just certain costs that maybe you probably wouldn't do in the normal course uh, of business. But because you have been running the business for some time, you, you you put something through through the business that you wouldn't usually. Okay, and all these things you're talking about, I'm guessing because they're the things that you see on a regular basis that need addressing. Yes, yeah, absolutely. The, the key, part, the real key part that, especially smaller accountants, it's probably because they haven't got the time on their hands and they're so busy, is just that internal reporting side, both on their financials, but also their client books and that information to be able to show the real guts of their business. Yeah, and I guess it's one of the byproducts of, of having what's primarily a, a time-based business model where you're, you're selling your time you know, every hour, every minute, therefore, is precious. And going, if it's available for, for selling to a client, well, that uh, always tends to take priority over keeping your own house in order. Yeah. Which, ironically, if you spent time keeping your own house in order, you might be able to um, work on getting a three or five or, you know, if, depending on the size, 10 times multiplier kicker um, to your hourly rate type of um, conversation. So get your house yep. in order you can really have a big difference to the valuation. Okay. Um, now, you've talked about there's being a bit of growth in the industry um, at the moment and uh, you know, the, the accounting uh, services, and, and yeah, we're just going through a bit of a boom at the moment. Got any thoughts on how long that, that might last? Activity A-wise within the market, certainly for the next 12 to 18 months, I can see it still continue to be very, very high. It's going to be interesting over the next two years in terms of what happens with the private equity backed um, uh, models uh, and platforms, because they're going to have to do their flip and their capital event at some point. I'm lucky enough to speak to some of the managing partners of some of those um, consolidators or platforms. And I don't know at what point there's going to be like crabs in a bucket scenario where a large platform is going to start looking at the other large platform that's been building up um, and looking to acquire them. That, that I'm sure will happen. Um, in the next two years or three years um, at the very most. But, but then likewise, underneath what we're seeing is those maybe young, younger individuals that are not happy being part of a larger firm are spinning out and setting up their own businesses. Um, but because of the, the smaller firms, as I said earlier on, about all the, the struggles and pressures they're going through, a lot of the smaller independents recently, like really small independents, like one to two million kind of firms or even less, um, they're going to be able to pick up a lot of sole practitioner or two partner firms and be able to grow themselves. So all 
all echelons and levels of the um, of the market is going to be really interesting over the next few years. Okay. So I guess what I'm hearing, what I think you're suggesting, is that if you're running an accounting practice at the moment and and you you're in pretty good shape. And you're thinking, you know, maybe five years is, is your exit. It might be worth having a look now if you've got your house in order because things are running pretty hot at the moment and, you know, timing in the market's not always the best advice, but it might be worth exploring and, and have a bit of a sniff around at the moment. I could not agree with you more. Uh, and this is a conversation that I have with a lot of individuals that are maybe thinking five, six years ahead. And, and then it becomes a, a work-life balance point of view because a lot of the platforms, um, have centralized services so a lot of the heavy lifting of running the business like the compliance hr marketing all gets taken off of you so then you can really just concentrate on what accountants love to do best which is look after their clients and probably help develop some of their team so if you are in that you know mid-term thought process I, I can't tell you that the valuations are going to be as high as they are in a few years time so if you are are there and thinking this is getting tougher and tougher you can really realize the value you've built today Still earn some nice money, probably have some uh, incentivized bonuses as well along the way with a salary, but a lot less strain uh, and hardship on your shoulders. Yeah. And just because you've transferred the ownership doesn't mean you can't work for another couple of years if you so desire. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Brilliant. Hey, look, I guess this one's not um, relevant to the accounting practices selling their businesses, but the PE, when, what's, the, what's their exit plan, do you think? Yeah, you know, they're not doing it just because they're nice guys and, and they want to create succession strategies for all the accountants out there. What's their big goal, do you know? So, so yeah, speaking to them, uh, it's quite interesting, actually, because it, it differs from PE house to PE house that you speak, you speak with. A lot of them still think there's two or three cycles left. Yeah, the interesting part, I guess, within the accountancy practice space is we've yet to see that, that full cycle. Um, yeah. We've seen investment go in, but we haven't seen a private equity flip uh, you know, I won't mention their names, but there's one particular quite large consolidator in the market that has tried a couple of times and it's not happened for them. Um, so it, it will be interesting. Uh, there's a few firms and platforms that are buying very, very quickly. And I know they'll probably be looking to flip to another pro private equity next year. Um, there are a lot of people that believe the big American firms that have always liked the idea of UK and Europe uh, will yeah. go, well, that's a, that's a lovely £80 million pound block. That makes it worthwhile for us. We'll go over and acquire. So I think there'll be a mixture of Private equity to private equity. I do yeah. wonder how many cycles. I, I, I personally think one or two absolutely max. And then it will be a case of the big American firms, I believe, coming over because the big American firms are now taking on private equity as well. James, look, I've, I've really enjoyed this and I think we could keep going. But there, there's, I'm, I'm just trying to think for the accountants and if, if the business owners out there who are going, okay, James knows his stuff and he, he's doing deals all the time. What, what's Is there a key message that you really want people to go, okay, so here's what James has been sharing with us today. What's, you know, have, have, tapping into your experience over the last few years, what's the one, the most important thing that you really want people to take away from, from what you've shared so that they can look after themselves in the best way possible, I guess? Yeah, I might answer in a different way to what you've put there, but I guess when, I, when, I'm, speaking to, when I'm speaking to clients or people that just approach me at events, etc., I always say, before you're still in, and if you are thinking about selling, think about, you know, think about your number. What, what is your number you want to achieve out of anything? That's going to serve you very, very well in your decision making. Be clear on your objective, both financially and non-financially. What yeah. is it you want out, want out of life? Get obviously, I know it sounds strange for accountants, but they will want to do this. Get, you know, get real tax planning advice in, in place, which will probably help number one and two in a certain way. Speak with someone like myself because we can see the whole industry understand all the different models that are out there um, it, and often can help tailor a deal to suit your needs and requirements because these are not these are not fixed in stone um, models that everyone has they, they they do tinker and tweak for each individual eventuality um, so we'll be able to there, be, there might be certain things that someone doesn't realize can be achieved through through a sale of this kind as well and then ensure you concentrate on preparing ready to sell I know it's very hard when people first set up their business but really, you should be, at the minute you set up your business, be thinking about what is my exit like? And then every decision that you make along that way will help you get to the end goal that you're looking for. But obviously, when you're in that startup mode, you're, you're excited, you just think like clients, team, and you're just looking forward. But actually, you should really think about these things ahead of time. Begin with the end in mind. Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. Brilliant. I love your sharing and, and some really great insights there. If people do want to follow up and have a chat with you um, and get some advice and, and you know, steering from you, what's the best way they can do that? Uh, follow me on LinkedIn, James Goslin, AJ Chambers, um, or you can drop me an email, which is james.goslin, which is G-O-S-L-I-N-G, at aj-chambers.com. Um, love to have a chat with you. E even if you're only thinking about selling or just, just purely curious about what's going on in the industry, I'm happy to have a chat. And um, yeah, happy to have a chat and help. And we'll include all those details in the show notes on the website so that if they want to get in touch with you, they can clearly do it. Um, I have a follow of James on, on LinkedIn as well. So uh, you can tap into me as well and, and find James. James, thank you. Really appreciate you sharing your exit insights with us today, specifically for accounting and uh, also legal practices. Darrell, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Good to see you. Take care. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Exit Insights podcast. And if you have, now's a good time to subscribe and make sure you get notified of all future episodes. Now, if the topics have raised questions about the value potential in your business or how you will exit like a boss, then contact me and arrange a free strategy call where we can discuss what's required for you. Otherwise, if you'd simply like to learn more about how to prepare for when you want to exit, then you can download a copy of our ebook called It All Begins With Insights. The link is in the show notes. In this book, We'll show you how a business insights report can be used to assess your business to uncover your intangible assets and identify the value potential if you're ready for exit and your business is exit ready.